Okay, I've been using the Surface Pro 8 for almost two months now, with the redesign that closely aligns with the ARM-powered Surface Pro X, with a larger screen, smaller bezels, upgraded processor, and graphics, and now Thunderbolt 4. Like the Surface Pro 7 before, it's available in both silver and black. Surprisingly, this black version doesn't attract fingerprints, something I found to be an issue on other black anodized finishes, like the razor blade. It keeps it looking clean, which is especially nice considering it's a tablet, which is obviously designed to be handled more frequently than a traditional laptop. But handling it isn't always the most comfortable. At 1.96 pounds, it feels pretty heavy. That weight doesn't include the keyboard and pen cover. Attaching that will increase the weight by another 0.6 pounds, which this keyboard and pen is not included and in my opinion, essential to the whole Surface Pro experience. The corners are nice and rounded, so it's comfortable to hold in that respect. I just wish it was a bit lighter for handheld use, but you're essentially getting similar power to many traditional 13 inch laptops in a tablet. The display on this Pro 8 is now 13 inches, up from 12.3 on the 7. Of course, it supports touch and that Surface Pen too. It's an IPS panel with a high resolution at 2880 by 1920, which looks really sharp on a 13 inch, around 266 PPI. The colors also look great. Although with tablets like the iPad and others using more advanced screen tech like mini LED, it would be nice to see a Windows tablet at this price point do the same. Now, I purchased both the i5 and the i7 to test. Both are quad core with a 15 to 25 watt TDP and Intel Xe graphics. Both have soldered dual channel DDR4X RAM configurable up to 32 gigs. Storage starts at 128 gigs, but you can upgrade it to one terabyte. You can easily upgrade the SSD as well, but you will need to get a half height M.2 drive. Now the lowest configuration starts at 1099 for the i5 128 gig option. But again, that does not include the keyboard cover and pen, which is an additional $279 for both or 179 for the keyboard only. And due to the new design, you won't be able to carry over a Surface Pro 7 keyboard to this model. Both the i5 and i7 have active cooling and you can see the fan vents all the way across the top. I don't hear them in typical use, but it does get a bit warm on the back and you can feel the fans kick on when running moderately intensive tasks, like when using Photoshop. But the back gets much hotter and the fans become much more audible when running something more intensive, like running a benchmark or playing a game. I think the performance is good for the target audience, those who want an ultra portable with pen support. If you wanted, you could do something more demanding like video editing if you needed to, but I would recommend a traditional laptop if you're going to need to do something like that on a daily basis. All benchmarks were tested with core isolation turned off, which went on is reported to have lower performance in Windows 11. The Intel Xe graphics work well enough for lighter games like Hades, but don't expect to play the latest AAA games on this thing. It's still a mobile processor with integrated graphics. You will need to hook it up to an eGPU to get better performance in games that are more graphically intensive. It comes with the Windows 11 out of the box, which looks good, mostly feels like a facelift from Windows 10, new icons, updated start menu location, and much nicer menu UI, among many other updates. I haven't had any compatibility issues so far for any of the software I use, such as games, code editors, photo and video editing software, and the alike. For I.O., there are two Thunderbolt 4 ports, making it much easier to hook up multiple high-resolution monitors, and it works well with Thunderbolt 3 and 4 docks. As I mentioned earlier, you can use it with an eGPU. I've actually made a couple of videos testing the eGPU performance on this channel. There are no more USB-A ports, so you may need to get a dongle if you still need access to that. I find this a bit disappointing personally, as all of my favorite mice use a USB-A dongle, but it is understandable. Obviously, Bluetooth mice exist, so oh well. Of course, you still have their Surface connector and a headphone jack, but no micro SD card slot this year. The typing experience is still very impressive on the keyboard cover. The keys feel like they have far more travel than you would expect on such a thin cover and include a white backlight. Keys feel clicky, but they're not too loud, well-spaced, and the cover feels very sturdy in the upright position. The magnets do a great job holding the cover in place. The Windows Precision trackpad is also great. It's precise, has a smooth texture, but the click is still quite loud and it's not very large, but there's only so much space to work with here. I was really surprised by the improvements made to the Surface Pen 2. I don't do a lot of drawing, but I do like to use the pen for tasks in Photoshop. And I'm finding the pen shape to be more comfortable than the Apple Pencil to hold. And the 120 Hz refresh rate helps the pen feel more responsive. 
as the screen is updating at a faster rate, making that perceived speed of the pen input to increase. There's also a bit of haptic feedback built into the pen. You can update the intensity of it in the settings. I have mine set to 50%, but what it does is it tries to use the vibrations to mimic the surface texture you would experience when using a traditional pen or paintbrush. While it's not perfect, I found the vibrations in the pencil mode to be pretty convincing. The most disappointing part for me is the battery life. The 51.5 watt hour battery is only getting me around six to seven hours of use doing basic productivity tasks like word processing, browsing the web, and video streaming at 50% brightness. And that decreases by around an hour if I leave the refresh rate at 120 Hertz. Microsoft says they are working on an adaptive refresh rate in an upcoming update. So hopefully that update is effective at giving us the best of both worlds, fast and smooth refresh rates and longer battery life. Overall, you'll want to keep the 65 watt charger with you. Luckily, it's quite small and compact and still includes that USB-A charging port. I can't help but to feel like this USB-A port should start supporting data as well, especially now that there are no USB-A ports on the device itself, similar to what Apple is doing for the Ethernet port on the new iMacs. Now, overall, this is the Surface Pro I've always wanted from Microsoft, only it feels one or two years late. It's still the best Surface Pro to date. The redesign with the larger screen, thinner bezels looks just as good as I hoped, and the inclusion of the Thunderbolt ports opened the door to new peripherals, such as the eGPU, making the device very versatile. But the lackluster battery life and weight of this device make using it as a tablet a bit of a chore. And while the upgraded processor has good performance, it's still not at the level of other 13-inch traditional laptops, especially in a post-M1 MacBook Air world. Still, this tablet device has its audience, and if you've owned and loved previous Surface Pro devices and you're looking for an upgrade, this is the one to get.